Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Ri Richard Wilson, which I'm, I'm really actually, I'm slightly intimidated by anyone who's heard him introduce everyone is that you cannot, you cannot compare. It's a, it's a, it, well, his introductions are lectures in, in themselves. And it, it I, you know, how can, how can you paint a new Mona Lisa? And so I'll, I'll, I'll just, to, just have to say a few, hopefully kind words about Richard and having him here, uh, which is in a way an, 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 an odd, odd situation because Richard has us uh, uh, and he's, he's, been, he's been so helpful with the, this whole project uh, with Kiss It and um, uh, supportive of get, getting not just this uh, day together but the previous days and everything else together. Uh, and there's not much I, I can say that hasn't been really said al already. Um, but one thing I have, I have to say that is, is as, well, as well known as, as, as Richard Wilson is, I th still think that he is under read. There seems to be this sort of uh, general idea about secret Shakespeare being about how Shakespeare was Catholic, which not that's not really <laughs> that's not really what what he's saying in that book. And this is something it's, it's much more subtle and dare I say sane, because it's it's more about the world in which uh, Shakespeare lived. Having said that, is it's he's he's written so many books, and the key word is to be seems to be well world. Uh, his latest book, Worldly Shakespeare, is uh, the theatre of our goodwill, is just coming out, just being published, and I I I, I do encourage everyone to um, if they can get their hands on it. I've I've seen it, I haven't read it yet, but it is it is fantastic. Richard told me I, I don't have time, but I will. I will take the time now, because it's, it's a few times I, I, can, I can have the privilege to introduce him. Um, I can't, this, well, words fail me. Um, he's, been, he's been a tremendous support for me uh, personally and for this whole project, and this is one of, one of the few academics that I've come across that, who is so open and welcoming. Uh, and um, I think everyone here has, has uh, got, gotten that sign to Richard. And um, <coughs> without further ado, please welcome Professor Richard Wilson. Thank you, Jim. This is such a, an exclusive uh, afternoon that it feels almost like one of my dinner parties in Lewis. Perhaps we could have postponed it to that. But um, thank, you, thank you for being here, for staying and for coming. Uh, of course, this is a laboratory. It's very much work in progress. Um, and uh, it's been enthralling during the course of the morning, actually, to see work progressing. And uh, the response of the speakers to the questions has shown how the um, creativity of this seminar um, is, is important to all of us uh, and how we're bouncing off that creativity. This was a lecture that I actually wrote and it will emerge um, points uh, during the talk for a conference last year in Belgrade uh, in Serbia but it seemed um, to have a very appropriate uh, link with the theme of thresholds. I then gave it in Reykjavik so it's been given in two cities already at the uh, opposite ends of Europe, in Belgrade and in Reykjavik, uh, in ways that I address in the lecture, which is, uh, as you can see from the title, very much focused on the tempest as a threshold. Come onto these yellow sands and then take hands. It's very uh, active, this, isn't it? <clears throat> Come onto these yellow sands and then take hands, curtsied when you have, and kissed the wild ways whist. Ariel's song of welcome in the tempest is said to allude to Virgil's Elysian fields. 
where Aeneas watches the heroes dance on the golden sands and climbs a headland to be shown his descendants, men of Italian stock who extend Rome's empire to a country beyond the stars. So this is an invitation to come and link hands on an intertextual journey of which the end is more global than the lovers' meeting it invokes, as if it were an episode within a greater, continuous text of unimaginable scope. And as Miranda lifts the fringed curtain of her eyes to reveal, to marvel at Ferdinand, critics have in fact long viewed this fair encounter as a trope for the actual first encounter between Native Americans and Columbus on the golden sands of the Caribbean. Shakespeare is thereby felt to build the shock of the new world into a drama he structures as a set of variations on that apocalyptic discovery scene. For as Stephen Greenblatt writes, such wonder charged with desire, ignorance and fear is a quintessential response to what's to what Descartes calls a first encounter, a sudden surprise of the soul in face of the new. But critics also note how the Tempest ironizes this landfall with a snag that, as Claude Lévi-Strauss regretted, those who sailed the Atlantic thought less to discover a new world than their old world confirmed. By turning the Virgilian metaphor of the voyage as a figure for cultural mobility back upon itself. Thus, the play stages the disappointment that Columbus knows in advance what he will find, as Phaeton Todorov sighs. For the goddess Ferdinand thinks he meets is, of course, Prospero's Italian daughter, while Miranda's supposedly brave new world is no more beauteous than a photo call of all the corrupt and criminal politicians of the European Union. Bound sadly home for Naples, in contrast to the relief with which the mariners merry make for joy when Aeneas sets sail for Italy in Marlowe's Dido, Queen of Carthage, the play Shakespeare may have acted at the start of his career, and that this seems to reprise, the Tempest enacts the disenchantment of its own critics, when its westward longings rebound in the anticlimax of return to a fortress Europe where, in Prospero's weary words, every third thought shall be my grave. Thus, if this farewell to the stage is, as the Polish critic Jan Kott argued, a history of the world in abbreviated form, that seems to be the Eurocentric history which Jack Derrida taught us to suspect for having the totalizing logic of the end of history, a faux pas or step of hospitality that is no hospitality from a Europe closed on the outside precisely to the extent that it claims to be open inside. Ariel's song about curtsying to recursive power can stand then not only for the false perspective false prospectus by which Virginia was colonized as a heading for messianic destiny, but for our own déjà vu, as every new world relapses into an old west and hospitality curdles into hostility. For the cruel hoax that Derrida archly called Europe's hospitality is exposed when the invitation to all comers is instantly qualified by Prospero's enslavement of Ferdinand as a condition for admission. Come, I'll manacle thy neck and feet together. This is the treacherous hospitality which historians key to a shift from charity to calculation and that Adorno and Horkheimer traced in the footfalls of Robinson Crusoe. Yet Derrida also helps us to see how from its first ironic words, when the boatswain shouts, what cheer, the Tempest asks us to be cheerful in hope that the coming hour might still be newly new, an opening and a non-exclusion 
for which Europe would in some way be responsible, as if a willing suspension of disbelief in the project of inclusion was itself the qualification for a European birth certificate. The hours now come. The very minute bids thee ope thine ear, obey and be attentive. What Shakespeare took from Marlowe in The Tempest was the trick of rehearsing the east-west course of history in order to blockade it. But what he then asked was the cost of this reversal. For the story of his life, with which Prospero sends Miranda to sleep, presages revisionist readings of the play in reorienting a narrative that promised to be bound towards the still vexed Bermudas back to the trauma of an exodus in the dead of darkness from the gates of Milan. It is easy to see why new historicist critics began insisting the focus on new world colonialism obscures the play's discourse of old world imperialism and that the true context of the Tempest is the middle Europa of the Habsburgs or the Prague of Rudolf II just when globalization ceased to be identical with the American dream. There was a parallel between this referral of the play's crimes back onto what happened one midnight at the gates of Kafka's castle and the rendition of America's bad face onto the dark, backward, and abyss of European history. Yet even as it recycles its flotsam and jetsam to the same old world, the potential of the Tempest continues to hinge on an opening into some new one as if its literal location cannot escape confusion with the figurative, or as though the liminal scenario of a drama obsessed with putting people in their proper places gave its locus the screening function of a quarantine station, refugee asylum, or internment centre, one of those placeless interstitial non-spaces of exception where the European project will be reformed and perfected, both geographically and socially. Fifty years ago, Cott imagined Prospero's Island as a concentration camp, a garden of torment designed by Hieronymus Bosch. Today, the setting of the play might be the kind of intermediate site, such as the Port of Calais, in which Europe's post-colonial Saint-Papier are indefinitely detained pending dispensation of the hospitality that you can live here, but you can never be at home. For in this lawless limbo, more than anywhere in Shakespeare, we confront what Giorgio Agamben has analysed as the camp as nomos of the modern, in the nexus between the state of exception and the zone of indistinction. And the Tempest has lately acquired extra sinister specificity from the uncanny coincidence that a likely geographical analogue for the Isle has indeed long been identified by editors as Lampedusa. The tourist paradise, midway between the plays Tunis and Naples, voted the best beach in the world in 2013, that having, its given, having given its monstrous name to Giuseppe, the princely author of the leopard, Lampedusa himself, the leopard, a Gramscian diagnosis of the transformismo at the heart of Italy's own southern question, that if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change, has become a purgatorial holding center for thousands of Europe's African migrants. Shakespeare read about a hermitage on the fire island of Lampedusa in Ariosto's Orlando Furioso, it has been suggested. But if so, Prospero's fictional island has been changed utterly by its association with this factual place of terrible beauty. The theatre of bare life in which the Tempest is staged shares many of the histrionic characteristics of the 21st century disaster zone, where the biopolitical management of humanitarian crisis 
is performed to instantiate the power to let die or make live. Prospero's humane care over the deportation of the damned witch Sycorax from Algiers when pregnant with her freckled whelp Caliban and, and abandonment on those cruelly deceptive sands by the sailors has in any case been laden with terrible surplus meaning due to the torture, rape and drowning of the boat people of Lampedusa. And his image of a rotten carcass of a butt is now shadowed by photos of the crammed hulks with nor tackle, nor sail, nor mast that the very rats have quit in which these Libyans and Somalians have been left to cry to the sea that roared to them. Ariel's devilry at having flamed amazement by setting fire to the ship from Tunis can likewise never sound comic again after the horror that occurred off the island in October 2013 when 366 diesel-soaked migrants burned to death. If you think they risk their lives on a boat that cannot even float, remarked a commander of the melodramatic Italian rescue operation entitled Mare Nostrum, it opens your eyes to something you maybe thought was different before he tailed off, as, words, as if words cannot do justice, the Guardian reported, to the reality of the calamity. But it is to such a state of emergency in our sea that Shakespeare seems to want to open our eyes when he has Miranda place responsibility for the disaster on her father's art. If by your art, my dearest father, you have set these wild waters in this roar, allay them. Oh, I have suffered with those I saw suffer. Oh, the cry did knock against my very heart. Poor souls, they perished. On October the 27th, 2014, Baroness Annalee announced the British government would no longer support Mediterranean rescue operations, as we believe they create an unintended pool factor, encouraging more migrants. As a theorist of arrivance, Derrida would therefore have been intrigued to learn how much pain and peril follow in the tempest from just such pool factors, encouraging guest workers to approach, come, hither, come, come on, come forth, come thou tortoise, when? Prospero's impatient calls to come away, come, remind us how much his power in fact depends on these inducements to enter, as Ariel sings, presently, before you can say come and go and breathe twice and cry so-so, each one tripping on his toe will be here with mop and mow. This is how he conjures his slave at midnight from Bermuda. But the word to say come and go is strophe, as in catastrophe, Derrida points out. And the treacherous turn of those wild waves' callous game of whist in which we watch the vessel dashed all to pieces is a marker of how catastrophic this cold coming will always be on that dangerous threshold where, as the philosopher writes, in work after work of the European imagination, from daybreak in the Oristia, the master of the house waits anxiously for the arrivant who he will see rising into view on the horizon as either a nemesis or liberator. Either a nemesis or liberator. Thus the direful spectacle of the wreck that fronts the tempest suggests that this will be a drama not only about colonialism, race and slavery, but also the strange ethics of hosting, guesting and repatriation in a disconnected time like our own of terrorism, mass migration, and anxious waiting for barbarians. With Shakespeare, Derrida wrote, we never know whether we are coming or going, and the time is always out of joint. 
because this author is a gatekeeper who prizes open meanings. Poetic and thinking peepholes through which he will have kept watch over the English language at the same time as he signed his body with the same unprecedented stroke of some arrow. In the euphoria of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the philosopher may have been thinking of the glorious crannied hole or chink through which Pyramus and Thisbe try to make love in a Midsummer Night's Dream, a loophole that reverses the tragedy of Romeo and Juliet when the lavatorial joke brings down the wall that parted the fathers. Derrida was not the first to perceive how Shakespeare's negative capability frets through the little hole of discretion to undermine the old castle of Europe in which Rome's legacy serves at best to stop a hole to keep the wind at bay. But in Spectres of Marx, this Derridian play on the name of Shakespeare posts the dramatist as a shaking spear carrier, a watchman on the walls of the besieged Europe where Paul Valery stationed Hamlet in an epochal essay of 1919, an immense terrace dividing the continent on which the Prince of Denmark stands sentinel over a ruined heritage. Like Kierkegaard, Derrida was transfixed by fear and trembling. But it is this signature ordeal of undecidability, the hesitating pause or verbal stutter which puts these texts under erasure, that in one of the finest tributes surely ever paid the bard becomes a hermeneutic model for what, in Derrida's imagination, Europe's household might become. Is it possible to gather under a single roof the apparently disordered plurivocality of all these interpretations? Is it possible to find a rule of cohabitation under such a roof, it being understood that this house will always be haunted rather than inhabited by the meaning of the original? This is the stroke of genius, the signature of the thing Shakespeare, to authorise each one of the translations, to make them possible and intelligible without ever being reduced to them. <coughs> Haunted by its own history, yet ever accessible to the new interpretations Puck invites when he concludes A Midsummer Night's Dream with the appeal to give me your hands if we be friends. It was the open handshake of this poetry of commodious thresholds that made Derrida long to be a Shakespeare expert because everything is in Shakespeare, everything and the rest. Thus the greatness of Romeo and Juliet arises, he argued, from how the text opens its external borders or its internal social landscape to all the different possible ways it can be read. So according to Derrida, these plays are not only about the impossible double injunction to keep open house, yet maintain it in the face of the other, but are constituted in their singularity and universality by that Janus-faced duality. The philosopher never wrote on The Tempest, but had he done so, he would therefore surely have commented on how much its temporality is key to what its outcasts experience differentially as the temperature of its location. The paradox that though this island seemed to be a desert, uninhabitable and almost inaccessible, yet it must needs be of subtle, delicate and tender temperance. For the island is a paradigm of the thing Shakespeare, being an approximation of the non-place Derrida described to Catherine Malibu in their memoir, Counterpath, as the place of the event, the Cora that owes its chance to the imminence of the holy other in the voyage towards arrival. It is the dramatist's catastrophic interception in the logic of the West 
that follows the drift of the Homeric voyage only in order to reaffirm the law of the house which it obstructs. As W.H. Auden clocked in his poem, The Sea and the Mirror, by allowing each of its stranded passengers to demand, where is the master? And so to set a new compass, as though they were all travelling with Derrida, in the words of Counterpath, by taking the Odyssey and Aeneid by surprise, exploring a jagged landscape full of effects and collapsing, following the thread of a strange and perilous adventure that consists in arriving without deriving. Derrida helps us to grasp how by literally isolating or insulating them on an island not far from Rome, yet outside the grand narrative, the Tempest permits Europe's entrance and returnees to stop this brave vessel and to reset its compass. But while recent critics respond to the question put by the bosun during the hijacking, what care these roarers for the name of king, and ponder the irony that the roars that punctuate the play are those of the detainees kidnapped and tortured in this Guantanamo-like compound by the state terrorist, Prospero, less attention is given to the ensuing scenario, which is the salvage operation to rebuild from the hulk of the royal good and gallant ship that headed the fleet, a flagship as tight and yeah, and bravely rigged as when she first put out to sea. Despite the suspense of this hostage crisis, the audience knows that safely in harbour is the king's ship berthed. In dry dock, there she's hid. Yet from the moment when Prospero compels Miranda to look into the abyss of time for a motive of his strategy of rendition, this play, governed by the archive fever of Desert Island Discs, the BBC radio programme in which castaways are required to select their favourite books and music, asks us to reconsider the logic of refloating a capsized ship of state that has been such a figurehead of European power back on its agonitic course, and thereby to pause on the question which Derrida addressed in the other heading, Reflections on Today's Europe, the essay he wrote in 1994 as his mission statement for the European Union of what it means to not only head in a particular direction, but to allow oneself to come under a heading or cultural capital, such as the project now being gathered to a head by the playwright of the globe. Now does my project gather to a head my charms crack not, my spirits obey, and time goes upright with his carriage. Towards the end of the tempest, the ship's master, who to the horror of King Alonso was invisible during a storm, is glimpsed by his crew dancing around the capstan, capering to eye her. And it is tempting to identify in this capering skipper an encapsulation of the capacious author himself, Cap Ape, and capitalising on his career with a goatish Capriol. But before we capitulate to this Capricornian caprice, it becomes important to know where we are heading in a capriccio turned to the deep and dreadful organ pipe of thunder when such captivating sounds and sweet airs invite us to come with a thought. For as Derrida reminds us, there is a great cargo of capital invested in the heroic saga of the westward voyage that Shakespeare diverts with his tragic comedy, as there is also in the ancient topos implied by his title of the catastrophic storm that compels a different or opposing course. The word cap, caput, capitis, refers to the head, ordered by the man in charge from the advance point that he himself is. It is he who holds the helm. He is the head man, and oftentimes he is called the captain. 
So when the shipwrecked and dispersed are all met again and upon the Mediterranean float, how can these ransom captives tell if their embarkation will be a fresh start or more of the same travail, seeing as their detention ordeal has been as fraught as that of the good ship we witnessed swallowed with its fraughting souls? No wonder, indeed, that echoing Virgil's New Age fourth eclogue the steward Stefano sings, I shall no more to see, to see. For in this story, each new departure is at risk of being gathered to a head in nothing more than yet another European victory parade. Oh, rejoice beyond a common joy and set it down with gold on lasting pillars. In one voyage did Clarabelle her husband find in Tunis and Ferdinand, her brother, found a wife where he himself was lost. Prospero his dukedom in a poor isle, and all of us ourselves, when no man was his own. Gonzalo's triumphal columns are said to invoke the Pillars of Hercules, captioned by Charles V in 1517 with his motto, Plus Ultra, and appropriated by Elizabeth I as indicators of her global reach. These cloud-capped towers thus cap the trail of illusions linking the tempest to the Rome of the Aeneid, and the old courtier rejoices that Prospero has set the ship back on its imperial course, the Translatio Imperii. But if Gonzalo's capitals are gateposts to the new world, they are equally a port of entry, for the port is sometimes a cake. And we are here on this island, not far from a place where the port and the cape are one. So, like the windward expansion of every European capital city, the phallic pointers also figure how, as Derrida notes, it is always in a westward heading that Europe, Europe determines and cultivates itself in order to make its difference into a simple interior border well guarded by vigilant sentinels of being. This counter-signification, symbolic of the gated isolation of an Occident gathering to a head, closing itself off behind its gates, is what is inscribed in the caption that started to bind the golden pillars about 1600. None plus ultra. For the point when Europe appoints itself the avant-garde of history, advancing as the capital of capitals, is also when Derrida observes the ends and confines. The finitude of Europe begin to emerge as the capital of universality finds itself in danger. Europe ceases to be the exception, the instant that Occidental culture is globalized and its thought becomes universal. Hence the paradox. Globalization is Europeanization, and yet Europe is always withdrawing into itself, forever at risk of becoming an allegory of autoimmunization. Tellingly, when Francis Drake adopted the twin metaphors of the frontispiece of his advancement of learning, the galleon stuck between them anchored while the columns were bookends representing the universities of Oxford and Cambridge. As the philosopher Petter Sloterdijk comments in his History of Globalization, it is of epoch-typical significance that Bacon's ship has come home. For the delimited context of the Tempest is thereby the crisis of spirit as sun sets on a civilization fated to receive into marginality when Europe sees itself on the horizon, from its end, the horizon in Greek is the limit, from the imminence of its end. This is the recessional hour of the sounding of alarm, the signal for the final disorientation of European interests, or revolutionary de-easting marked by Montaigne, with the premonition that because life there is, as Gonzalo reports, more gentle kind, a new world will arise as Europe falters. Europe, from the Akkadian word erebu, 
sunset has always been the twilight zone. So although Prospero imagines time still goes upright with his carriage, it is also long past the time, as Ariel keeps insisting, when their work should cease. Because in this play, it is always much later than the master thinks. Difficult, in any case, at such a late hour, as Derrida wrote, to say Europe without connoting Athens, Jerusalem, Rome, Byzantium. For while it has most often been misinterpreted as imperialist, the discourse of the Tempest is in fact the post-imperial one of a 17th century Spengler, such as Justus Lupsius, when he prophesied the decline of the West. Once the East flourished, Assyria, Egypt, and Jewry excelled in war and peace. That glory was transferred into Europe, which now, like a diseased body, seemeth unto me to have her great confusion nigh at hand. For behold, there now ariseth elsewhere new people and a new world. Oh, the law of necessity, wonderful and not to be comprehended. All things run into this fatal whirlpool of ebbing and flowing, and some things in this world are long-lasting, but not everlasting. Our revels now are ended. We are old, as Derrida says, and the difficulty we have in envisaging a Europe torn away from repetition of itself in a renewal that would not revive genocidal plans for some new order, has for too long been the dialectic of our modernity. As the Tempest attests, guilt and self-accusation no more escape this old program than does celebration of the self. So Cott bleakly remarked that the end of this play is so depressing because the characters resume all their former places. History has turned full circle. The Polish critic feared Prospero's harping upon the particular accidents in the story of my life gathers his listeners into the eternal recurrence of an infernal cycle of genocide, exodus and persecution. The Tempest returns to its point of departure on this view because it enacts the repetition compulsion of an accident like that detailed in Leonardo's notebooks. Where all Europe's exemplary culture, art and science, are devoted to the weapons of mass destruction, needed to ensure that this continent stays exceptional. As prime duke, Prospero likewise contrives that for the liberal arts, he remains without a parallel. Thus for Cot, the apocalyptic nuclear feat that dimmed the noontide sun, called forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azured vault set roaring war, is the capstone of the magician's art. As each vision of the island this capo de capi devises recapitulates the violence of a Leonardo. This is a more negative critique than even the post-colonial one, which claims the text displaces its guilt onto the colonised in Caliban slave revolt. For it implies the double bind Derrida pinpointed in the other heading, that Eurocentrism and anti-colonialism, gathering and globalising, are dual headings of the same caput mundi, which, whether in the capacity of a Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, Paris, London, or Washington, is destined never to escape the recurring nightmare about the return of its repressed through the capaciousness of its own open ports of entry. Tell me, heavenly bow, if Venus or her son, as thou dost know, do now attend the queen, since they did plot the means that dusky disc, my daughter got, her and her blind boy's company, I have forsworn. Of her society be not afeard. I met her deity, cutting the clouds towards Paphos, and her son, dove-drawn 
with her. Prospero's mask, in which the negritude of Hades, king of the underworld, justifies yet another family deportation of Venus and her waspish-headed son Cupid to Cyprus, was perhaps added to the Tempest for a wedding in 1613 of Princess Elizabeth to the German Prince Frederick. Brokered to auspicate a European Union, this match, in fact, ignited the Thirty Years' War. But if this play within a play is such a political intrusion, it confirms Derrida's thesis on how panic about Europe's internal difference is always displaced. When the play proper, when in the play proper, Alonso would not bless our Europe with his daughter, but would rather loose her to an African by marrying Clarabelle to the Queen of Tunis, to the King of Tunis. For the mask takes back what that marriage gave with an ethnic cleansing, seemingly vindicated when Prospero recalls Caliban's foul conspiracy during a dance of temperate nymphs and sunburnt sycamore that abreacts both the Algerians' Othello-like plot to rape Miranda and the race myth of Persephone, frighted by dusky dis. While he may never have written on this play, as a dusky Maghrebian Jew, a sort of Murano, the waspish-headed philosopher alerted us to how European identity is patrolled in this way on the yellow sands of the Mediterranean, according to Afro hair and sunburned skin. Yet as an uprooted African, born in Algiers, in an environment about which it will always be difficult to say whether it was colonizing or colonized, and so neither northern nor southern, Derrida positioned his deconstructionist project at the same threshold, on the shores of the European language he had been taught, and with which, like the uprooted Algerian Caliban, he assuredly knew how to curse. It is Derrida, this over-colonized European hybrid who might help explain why the return of the repressed memory of Caliban's puny rebellion prompts Prospero to demolish his mask with such violence it leaves his old brain troubled. The anger and passion with which Shakespeare's Magus deconstructs his masterpiece into a strange, hollow and confused noise always looks over-determined like the reaction to deconstruction itself. But as the hybrid philosopher remarks, the crisis for European identity as a capital discourse emerges with the revelation of the proximity of its heading to its anti-heading, of beheading, decapitation. Of course, the Algerian terrorist plot to knock a nail into his head, brain him, or with a log, batter his skull, will never spell kaput for Prospero. More to the point is Caliban's filiation with wicked Hannibal, the captain of the alternate Barbary shore, who from a standpoint of the European capital he might have captured was truly capable of all ill. Chantal Zabous has recently noted that while Cannibal rhymes emphatically with Hannibal, among all possible etymologies for Caliban, a derivation from the African military genius is never listed. Like the forgotten king of Tunis, Caliban's true capability is thereby neutralized. But that repression might be because, as Derrida points out, far from being puny, the capacity of Hannibal's opposing Punic cape was in every sense capital. This Mediterranean, this Mediterranean shore interests me, coming as I do from the other shore, a shore that is principally neither French nor European nor Latin nor Christian because of the word capital. In the freedom of the spirit, Valerie makes a determined appeal to the word capital precisely in order to define culture and the Mediterranean. He evokes navigation, exchange, this same ship, that carried merchandise and gods, ideas and methods, 
That is how our wealth came into being, to which our culture owes practically everything. The Mediterranean has been a veritable machine for making civilization. He'd sow it with nettle seed. Cato's paranoia that Delenda es Carthago, Carthage must be, Carthage must be destroyed and Rome's annihilation of its Semitic rival by raising its walls and sowing its soil with docks and nettle seed haunt the political unconscious of the Tempest in the dispute of the wedding party about whether this Tunis was Carthage. Like the critics, Gonzalo buries the African capital beneath the Aeneid. After Sebastian puns, he hath raised the walls and houses too. And Shakespeare, who makes continual reference to Troy as the citizen that gave birth to Rome, only ever mentions Rome's great granary by the lurid light of that fire that burned the Carthage queen, Var Virgil's version, smugly cited by Lorenzo to illustrate how Jessica did steal from the wealthy Jew, of the desolation when the queen of Carthage stood upon the wild sea banks, wafting her love to come again to Carthage. Yet this suppressed Semitic heading seems to return in the surprise topography of Prospero's mask with what Derrida called its nostalgery for the North African climate, with its barns and garners never empty, where, like Valerie, Shakespeare seems to gather the memory of Mediterranean civilization around freedom, the grapevine, and the book. For the Romans did indeed envy the opposing shore, its vines and clustered branches bowing, and its mountains where live nibbling sheep. So despite the play's breaches of hospitality and its struggle to forgive, Shakespeare never lets us forget the invitation to that other heading and the feast not broken at the wedding of Claribel in the alternative capital that Europe would repress. She that is Queen of Tunis, she that dwells ten leagues beyond man's life, she that from Naples can have no note unless the sun will post, the man in the moon's too slow, till newborn chins be rough and razorable. Europe's opposing shore haunts Shakespeare's text because recognition of the self in this absent other precipitates the sensation of insatiable lack the desire like that provoked by Derrida's postcard, which Cato famously dramatized in the fatal debate when the censor threw down his petit objeta, an African fig, and as the senators admired its size and beauty, pointed out that the land where these figs grew was just three days from Rome. So in their fury and frustration, the Romans made a wilderness and called it peace. And Appian records how over, how over ten days the streets of Carthage were systematically firebombed, and its defenders flung themselves into the conflagration until the wife of the commander, Hasdrubal, threw herself and her children into the flames. It was a bloodbath, admits a modern historian. The cruelty was unbelievable, and a thick deposit of ash memorializes the cremation. Virgil projected this holocaust onto the sati of widow Dido, but Strabo estimated that of 700,000 citizens, barely 50,000 survived. Its incinerators consecrated the ash to Hades, yet the Roman general Scipio wept as he quoted Homer, Troy will one day perish. Sic gloria transit mundi, as Derrida moralizes in cinders after Nietzsche, our entire world is the cinder of innumerable once living beings. But the obliteration of the cloud capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples of Carthage especially appalled Shakespeare's colonizing generation, according to Richard Helgerson because imperial self-making necessarily entails an undoing that speaks for the victims. The new poetry of 16th century Europe is a poetry deeply at odds with itself. 
The Renaissance scholar is here annotating the sonnet from Carthage of 1535 by the Spanish laureate Gasolazo de la Vega, which sets out to praise Charles V's conquest of Tunis, but then gets distracted by memories of the Roman conflagration to collapse into a self-cancellating immolation that exactly prefigures Prospero's auto-destruction. As the poet reflects how tears and ashes, how in tears and ashes I am undone. And Sinitza made as ego. The new world and new monarchies of Shakespeare's era made the old dream of universal empire marvelous news. Helgeson agrees. But this miraculous newness was news to of an undoing which opposed Europe's heading with its decapitation. As Roman Carthage, the victor and the vanquished, ultimately share the same fate. The great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this baseless, insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. Well done. Avoid. No more. Prospero's dismissal of the nymphs and reapers, he is called to come hither from the forrow, and the Mediterranean deities Iris, Ceres, and Juno have been summoned to come and sport with their bounteous donation of wheat, rye, barley, vetches, oaks, and peas, climaxes the sequence of broken promises and reversals of hospitality that begins in the tempest with the wrecker's trick of luring the good ship onto the yellow sand. Repeatedly, the plot reprises the catastrophic vault farce of Ariel's song, where the invitation to join, take hands and kiss, triggers the watchdog's bark as the guards sound the alarm dispersedly within. Bow wow, bow wow. Though they first appeared in the benevolent guise of the Lares as sweet sprites, dancing along the borders of Prospero's domain. These vigilantes will be unchained when Caliban, Stefano and Trinculo break into the house in the shape of dogs and hounds with Prospero and Ariel setting them on. Their deterrent names then will be Mountain, Silver, Fury and Tyrant. And as these mastiffs savage the intruders, hunting them down, Ariel's sadistic cry, hark, they roar, is one of those cruel twists that remind critics of the extermination of the Amerindians by the conquistadors. As, Le as Leslie Fiedler commented, by the time these guard dogs are finished, the history of colonial America has been prophetically revealed. Yet what this transatlantic perspective obscures is how this hue and cry has the same European strategy of catastrophic hospitality as all of Prospero's discovery scenes, since, as he announces, the magician has temptingly displayed his trash and trumpery in a veritable fashion arcade, deliberately for stale to catch these thieves. As Derrida remarks, the threat of unleashing the worst violence is always implicit in Europe's enticing invitation to its guests. We come across traps of this sort at every step, and they are all part of the programme. So whether in Tunis's, in Titus's cannibal banquet, Hamlet's deadly mousetrap, Goneril's calculated housekeeping, or Lady Macbeth's traitorous welcome, the, the catastrophic snare by which hospitality becomes a trap is at the heart of Shakespeare's tragic vision. But in The Tempest, where Gonzalo talks as if he might carry the island home in his pocket and give it to his son for an apple, the whole plot turns on the poisoned gift, which over and over tempts the detainees into the habitual trespass of disaster survivors as when they are incited by strange shapes, bringing in a banquet and dancing about it with gentle actions of salutations and inviting the king and his companions to eat, they are tempted. Accepting this offer as humanitarian aid, 
Alonso naively declares he cannot too much muse such shapes, such gesture and such sound. And the recipients imagine they are being offered the riches of El Dorado. But when Ariel suddenly descends like a harpy, an explosive thunder and lightning, to clap his wings upon the table, and with a quaint device, the banquet vanishes. They discover that this tantalizing invitation has been yet another citizenship test of the quarantine in their process of accession, and that the quaint device of the two-faced harpy with its fellow ministers is to turn violently against those judged unfit to be admitted. You are three men of sin, whom destiny, that hath to instrument this lower world and what's in it, the never-surfeited sea hath caused to belch up you. And on this island where man doth not inhabit, you amongst men being most unfit to live. After he condemns those unfit to live, Ariel vanishes in thunder. So when Derrida writes that he speaks of ghosts, of flames, and of ashes, his meditation on the demonic affiliation of the great spirits of Europe with fire, flame, burning, conflagration, brings the wind of the crematoria to the flight of Prospero's exterminating angel, and may explain why, from the fire and crack, of sulfurous roaring at the start to the rattling thunder to which he has given fire at the end, the regime of this commandant it, that this commandant imposes requires prisoners to fetch firing. That's requiring. The reek of burning that pervades the tempest therefore makes it distressing that in his 2003 lecture, Freud and the Non-European, Edward Said compared what he called the tidy fit of this play with Freud's Moses and monotheism, where the Jewish thinker also wrote a late work on another heading, in this case the legend that Moses was an Egyptian. Seid contrasted what he considered to be Shakespeare's rootedness with Freud's readiness to fragment his work a textual diaspora spurred by belief that his identity did not begin with itself, but with other identities, Egyptian and Arabian, that caused the psychoanalysts to deplore the Zionist fetish of a piece of Herodian war at the expense of the Palestinians. Freud, who never got to Rome, greatly admired Hannibal, sighed, dryly noted. Thus, the lecture was a plea, Jacqueline Rose explained, to read the classics for the still-shaping history they initiate in what Side termed our own age of population transfers, exiles, expatriates, immigrants, and refugees. As such, its praise of a cosmopolitan and wandering Freud over a homely and complacent Shakespeare seems like Side's own perverse misdirection repeated in his last book on late style, that in pleading for forgiveness, these late plays attain a banal perfection in holiness and resolution. Though Prospero promises the fleet calm seas and auspicious gales, in the tempest we never do set sail again. As though this Ulyssian voyage must remain forever suspended by the guilty memory of Carthage, or as if Shakespeare was anticipating the poet Blake's objection, that it is the classics, not the Goths nor monks, that desolates Europe with wars. That was the dark interpretation of Giuseppe, the Prince of Lampedusa himself, when he closed his own lecture on Shakespeare, reflecting that in The Tempest we encounter Shakespeare as the enchanter disenchanted, whose last testament is that his ending is despair. Those are the final words the Lord of smiles and shadows addressed to us before his death is how the novelist rounded off his reading of the plays. But Lampedusa's lecture is here surely just as misleading as sides because these are not, of course, 
the last words of the Tempest. Prospero's epilogue continues, that is, ending his despair, unless he is relieved by prayer, which pierces so that it assaults mercy itself and frees all faults. So the play, in fact, hangs on appeal that is truly Deridian, with the enjoinder that it is for us to complete the onward passage from the yellow sands of this catastrophic land of fire. Gentle breath of yours, my sails must fill. If we were all to accuse ourselves, there would no longer be an innocent person on earth, Derrida warned us in his own late work on cosmopolitanism, given that we are all heirs to persons or events marked by crimes against humanity. Yet that is precisely the endless deconstructive project on which Shakespeare now asks us to embark and then take hands. As you from crimes would pardoned be, let your indulgence set me free. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, wow, this... Um, you very, very skillfully went from various ends of the Mediterranean uh, and indeed of Europe. Um, very intriguing uh, and it will turn out to be very intriguing reading when it comes out or even listening. Um, well, let's open up. Uh, I'm sure there are many people who would want to ask Richard questions. I'm just kind of trying, trying to get, get my thoughts together because you went such a vast way in a very concise fashion. Um, thought provoking. So, um, can, can anyone put I ideas into words? David. I'll come closer to David so I can hear. the you. Yeah. Uh, you is. <laughs> is you. <laughs> um, I'm reminded um, of the banal but I think uh, tremendously suggestive lines in Auden's Paul Bunyan. Every day America is born and recreated. America is what we do. America is what you choose to make it. Um, you know, it's to be made new by us today, um, as you from Crimes and Pardon Me. Well, each of us will read it for ourselves in the solitude of our own tower. But, but, the but it's the audience at the yeah. Globe. Yeah, sure, of course it is. But, uh, um, but t tell us more, David. Tell us more about no, your no, thoughts on it. You, this, this is the mind that all Shakespeareans spend their lives meditating. Yeah, I mean, in one sense, it's obvious that. That, that it's the audience and uh, that the, the 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 actor having having uh, party disrobed himself of the character and it's only partly I mean it's a special moment because we don't quite know whether it's the actor or Prosper speaking and it's probably it's probably standing in the middle of the threshold at that particular point is uh, is indicating the degree to which he is in the power of the audience who can free. Fine. But, but the whole of your paper is focused on the fact that Europe cannot free itself of its other. Right. So we've got a situation in which the audience, if they're going to free Prospero, either has to be completely different from Europe or have to be complicit in the European project. And if they are complicit in the European project, do they have the power, the ethical power, to free Prosper? That's why I asked. Mm, mm. Well, I, I should explain. 
I, I explained at the beginning that I actually wrote this lecture, which is why it's probably uh, too portentous not to capsize the vessel, um, for a big conference in Belgrade. And I, uh, it was the 60th anniversary of the Comparativist Literature Department there, very invested in the European project. And then I was asked to give it a gaining record. So I've given it in two rather grand occasions at the, the bookends of Europe. And um, clearly, in those places, there was in, both in Iceland and in Serbia, there was an investment in the European dream of a kind that momentarily Angela Merkel awoke. Uh, that, to my eyes, was utterly innocent. <laughs> it was like uh, the moment uh, when we see the lovers playing chess. Um, how beauteous Europe seems to those in Reykjavik and in, after a financial crisis, and in Belgrade after everything. So, I think what you missed was some earlier remarks, apropos the Tempest, that I drew in from Derrida, about the disenchantment of the moment of the discovery of the new world being, nonetheless, a prelude to the eternal expectation and hope of a possible new world that the play itself as an event perpetuates. The play itself as an event is perhaps the best promise that we have. And I used a quotation directly from Derrida where he compares Shakespeare's endless hospitality to new interpretation and translation to the European project. The play is itself the best manifesto that we have in its endless openness to new interpretation and as an event in itself that will always be renewed by the nature of the performance of the possibility of a fresh horizon. The play itself. Uh, Ildi, you had a question? Yes, so it is um, <coughs> partly what you guys were discussing just now. Um, uh, my, my point relates to that. that and, and Richard, as you said, that the play is best kept as an event. So when you slot it into its original environment of what it was shaped for, the play, for example, the tempest of an open arena which is structured, getting the audience around and the actors invading that environment all the time, all of the um, metaphors take shape within that, within that symbol. And so the audience, because they're visible, they're always cast as a component part of the metaphors of the play. And because, as I think we start with a, with a uh, boat capsized scene, <laughs> the Tempest, by default, the audience take on the role of the, of the scenes, uh, probably. So as a contrast, so there's a ship on which the mariners enter, and so we are the scene. And then, um, so the violent forces of, of nature, for example. And then, um, in the end, when Miranda comes out with this uh, often uh, <coughs> liberated line, you know, the um, oh, brave new world, and how many, you know, what beautiful world it has such people in it. If you, can't, if you do it in a proscenium, those new people are only the old cast of uh, corrupt politicians, as but if you open it into the arena, it's them, but beyond, Miranda's talking to everyone beyond them. So what I'm trying to say is um, <coughs> the, the physical conditions of playing cast the audience as an active member of the, of the play, always. And uh, in this particular case, it seems that they cast us, it cast us both as the uh, reason of the calamity, She is implicating in us in this necessity of, of uh, you know, brave new world that has such people in it. And you said, I, am I such a person? But, uh, so in the, she, she gives us an expectation. She is known to the rogues and rapists and drunkards on the stage. She's also going to the rogues and drunkards and rapists in the audience. That's right, that's right. And the jokes that have to, you know, you can 
it's a verb if you want to think about it, you're still addressed. Mm. You can choose to think that you can be different. You can. You can and of course, I was reckoned very much against Kotz's interpretation. Kotz says the cruelest line in Shakespeare is Prospero's, which follows that, which is new to me. Kotz says that's the cruelest line in all of Shakespeare. And uh, that is you know, a dark post Auschwitz, post Hiroshima, view of the tempest. Which um, I think I was trying to suggest there it helps us to move on from mm -hmm. uh, in a voyage which is the theatrical experience. Um, he also didn't he say that then got said that another of the dark lines of Tempest is that moment when he and Prospero determines that they should be themselves. What us again? They should be themselves. That's a terrible sentence. Hmm. They should be themselves. Uh, Christian, did you? Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, so the notion that we cannot be free ever from our crimes, right? Um, I think part of that is rooted in the fact that we continue to commit crimes, even if we open up for Trishura. And especially when we open up for Trishura. So you had a line in your paper, you said, um, uh, you called it hospitality. Is that, is that fair? Hospitality, yeah. Okay. Uh, you can live when I, <laughs> curious enough, you may imagine that the copy editor in Belgrade, uh, well, this was published, sent it back. was a spelling You said, well, you can live here, but you will never be involved. And so that seems to me what the capitalist project is doing. Because neoliberal capitalism doesn't necessarily like the forces. In fact, it doesn't like the forces itself at all. You know, Angela Merkel is saying, come on, come on, come on in, come on in. And please line up over in that locker over there. Please line up, right? we'll put you to work, you know. They'll accept people in because they want to exploit them. They want to make profit from them. This is a new form of crime. And until we go to... Uh, a system, a way of life that isn't laden with crimes, then we cannot be part of it. That's, that's what I, one of the things that I got out of Yes, yeah, so I mean, it's not my whole interpretation is that she was based on the guest worker, on the uh -huh. concept of the guest worker. Uh -huh. You know this expression in Germany. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. You can live here, but you cannot be home. Yeah. But that, but that's actually. Well, then I realised how frequently <coughs> the, the scenes are structured around an invitation. How yeah. frequently the word "come," Derrida's favourite word, uh -huh. appears in the chapters. I think more than any other Shakespearean really text. Uh -huh. But that is in fact the case of everybody in the capitalism. Come, 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 come. But we're going to empty you of your soul. We're going to empty you of yourself. That's a invitation. That's why you can never be at home, and that's a general statement. Well, isn't the, the idea of what, why capitalism needs people because of the, the way it works now is a consumer market they need as well as consumers as, uh, as well as the uh, um, people who make, make it so a, a, lot, a, a lot of that functioning Well it is, consumes our labor power but it also needs them to yeah, yeah. in the end we're all exiled from ourselves yeah. we all become exiles Yes, yes um, I, time for one quick case. Okay. This evening, where's the yeah. um, yeah. um, Yes, I mean, Caliban, left on the island at the end, has been perhaps um, over interpreted for so long in terms of the post colonial moment. I mean, we're in the presence of someone who's written on this and knows about, more about this than anyone here. Um, that when the flag comes down and the Europeans leave that other colony, Caliban on the island. Um, uh, I must admit that I haven't deliberately paid attention to Caliban in that context, 
But of course, I was interpreting Caliban very much as an Algerian. Yeah. Um, uh, so, where does it leave Caliban? Well, w um, you might you might say it leaves it leave, leaves Caliban in the audience. Um, Caliban Caliban has you know, Caliban is in some sense the you being in, uh, being begged for forgiveness. Uh, but he's got a great deal to answer for himself. Um, in his, notably in his treatment of Ariel, uh, and his complicity in um, detaining Ariel for 12 years in a, in a cloven pine. Um, torturing and rendition is no stranger to Caliban in his previous rule on the island. So he has a lot to be forgiven for. As Derrida says, you know, if we were all to start asking forgiveness, we would never hear an end of it. Well, I'm uh, interested to hear Leslie's thoughts. From the heart of Europe. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think uh, time gives us a threshold. Stands up right in his carriage. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, well, please join me in thanking Rich, uh, Richard Wilson for a fantastic talk. Um, thank you, Richard. <laughs>